Hey everybody, this is TCG Productions here, and today we are working on the Gateway 510S system again. So I've got I've got some upgrades that I'm going to do to this system, and we're actually going to go ahead and toss a fresh copy of Windows XP on it. Because if you remember in the last video, which if you haven't watched it, I very strongly recommend you go and watch that right now. <laughs> I'll probably have the link to it down in the description, so... But anyways, if you remember the last video, uh, I took it out of the box, fired it up. Turns out it wasn't wiped, so I went ahead and wiped it. I also poked, also poked around a little bit to see when it last really did anything, which was quite a while ago. So, and also had a look inside the computer, discovered a really terrible piece of... Really, really terrible power supply that's probably going to have really terrible things done to it, much to my amusement, <laughs> at some point in the future. And I swapped in a temporary power supply. The, the memory configuration was a little bit whoppy-jawed because, because someone, had, someone had taken the very cheap route with upgrading the memory. So, and... Uh, yeah, you know, the optical drive. You know, one of the optical drives is obviously not stock, and it in fact actually almost one for one duplicates the features and functionalities of the original optical drive in the system. So I don't know if that was carried forward from the previous build or if that's just something they slapped in there to get a to to get themselves a second optical drive. So yeah, it's got a it's got a floppy drive. I can't recall if I ever tested it or not. Uh, we might test it in this video, uh, but the computer did. But the computer did work. So, and the hard drive was hard drive is a direct descendant of the Western of the Western Digital Protege series of drives, and those are pretty. Those are thoroughly, thoroughly unexciting, thoroughly unamusing, really basic builders grade drives that are meant. To, they're basically meant to, to fill out as, as many tick boxes on a manufacturer's checklist, at, on a manufacturer's list as they can, while providing reasonable, reasonable capacity. I mean, 80 gigabytes in 2003, 2004, that wasn't bad at all. 40 gigabytes would have been your budget option, and if you were really strapped for cash, or you or you were just running an older system to the bitter end, you might be running a 20 gigabyte drive, which with Windows XP and a few files and whatnot, 20 gigabytes goes quick. But 80 gigabytes in 2003, 2004 wasn't bad at all. It's just a slow hard drive. I mean, there, there's nothing exciting about it at all, other than the fact that it's a working IDE drive. And even then, even then, I've got a, I've got a few of those kicking around. So, anyways, I've got some upgrades in mind. Going to see if I can make a best effort attempt on a zero-dollar budget to correct the memory configuration in this system. I'm also going to go ahead and put an AGP graphics card in there. I did mention that I believe that the AG that the Gateway 510XL system uh, that used to be the old family computer had a graphics card in it. Now, uh, I didn't mention that the old family computer was directly a Gateway 510XL system, but I know that I did have an annotation somewhere in the video that says uh, that there's BitFay, check the description for more extended rambling. So, I, I really strongly encourage you to check out the video description on that first part, because there's a lot of extended rambling in there that you might be interested in. I mean, it's, it's like UXW Bill reminding people to read the video descriptions, because they contain useful information. So, I mean... <laughs> Check the video description. And, uh, anyways, I'm gonna go and swap in, uh, and, and the power supply, because I did mention that the power supply that I put in there was just some random temporary supply to get the system up and running on some actual quality clean power. So, I've got a decently good, period correct power supply uh, that's actually met would actually be deserving of a computer like this, or a computer like this would be deserving of such a supply. I have an ATI radi we got an ATI Radeon uh, 9600 XT, 128 meg 
with 128 megabytes of video memory, and uh, that also ha that also is sporting an AGP 8x link. Well, it, 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 it supports an AGP 8x link, so I mean the card's interface is AGP 8x. And here it is. You remember the video I made about the uh, Western Digital Cavi Western Digital 80 gigabyte uh, Western Digital Caviar Special Edition 80 gigabyte IDE hard drive a year or two or three ago? This is it. So this is the drive we're going to be putting in there, and I'd say that this system is very much well deserving of this drive. And finally, this is the stick of RAM that I'm going to be putting in there, because right now there's a two factory memory modules, which I think are 256 megabytes, maybe? I mean, what's 768 plus 512? 1280? Because, let me see, nope, not that one. You go away. Okay. 68, 512. Yep, 1280. There's one, there's one 512 uh, meg stick of RAM in the system, and that's it. That's the odd one out. So the odd one out is going to be taken out, and we're going to bring this system down to an even one gigabyte of memory, because... The factory modules are 256 megabytes. There's two of them. And then there's a couple of upgrade modules. There's an A-Pacer branded 256 megabyte module. And then there's some random, uh, basically no-name brand 512 mega, 512 megabyte module. And the memory configuration is completely incorrect for dual channel mode. Because the factory modules should be in 1 and 3 or 2 and 4. Because if you put them in 2 and 4 and you leave 1 and 3 empty, then you effectively terminate the open ends of your two memory channels, which can result in higher system stability uh, whenever, you, whenever you start having really high clock speeds or you're just hammering the memory really hard. But if you put them in 1 and 3, they're closer to the CPU. So, I mean, it's... I mean, on a system this old, that probably really doesn't matter, but on newer systems with memory, f with, uh, memory frequencies going higher than ever, some, with DDR4 and DDR5 systems sporting memory frequencies higher than ever, uh, terminating, correctly setting up your memory is critical. But anyways, I'm going off on a digression there. But the, uh, the, memory, the memory configuration in this system is completely incorrect. The factory memory module should be in 1 and 3 or 2 and 4, depending on what you prefer. And then the upgrade modules should go in the empty slots. And of course, all the module, and of course the modules in 1 and 3 should be matched, and the modules in 2 and 4 should be matched. So, I think, I think what I'm going to do, I think what I have planned is going to bring the system back up into proper dual channel mode dual channel memory mode which will be awesome because I do know I did notice that the the system's performance was rather lacking in nature <laughs> I mean even though it's a, even though it's a hyper threaded Pentium 4 which is in and of itself a pretty nice processor for the time especially a socket 478 Pentium 4 which I believe is what we have here it, the system was just slow and I mean, I imagine that it's, I mean, I imagine that's a three-way combination of a thoroughly, un, a thoroughly unexciting hard drive, uh, a grossly not correct memory configuration that put the system down into dual channel mode, single channel mode, and then just an old Windows XP install absolutely filled to the brim with bloatware, crapware, and just the effects of years and years and years of daily use. But anyways, let's go ahead and turn our attention to the computer in question. Now I have just realized that I probably should have... Yeah, I just realized that I probably should have gone ahead, disconnected the computer from everything, and actually laid it out on the table. But I completely forgot to do that, so so yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead turn the uh, turn the bench power supply off. Let's set our parts to the side here. So 
And I mean, we're just going to we're just going to go ahead and throw all of these things in all at once and uh, see what happens. Sort the problems out later, or if the entire thing just goes up in six foot flames, and I'll have an excuse to use a fire extinguisher hanging on the wall outside of the camera. Then give the smoke detectors a real world test. Hopefully that doesn't happen. I don't think it'll happen. This thing is heavy. I remember. I remember whenever I was tearing down the uh, 510XL system, moving that thing anywhere was a complete pain because, I mean, you have to, you, you kind of have to think about it. We're dealing with a computer here that probably weighs 35 or 40 pounds. You see, that was, tw I mean, I was, uh, I was a good 12 years, I was a good 12 years younger than I am now. So, so, yeah, it is complete, it is extremely easy to get into the case as usual, and so now what we're going to do is, we're going to go ahead and, un we're going to go ahead and get this cable jungle out of here, because this power supply is being removed, not because it's a bad power supply or anything, it just doesn't fit. It, it just doesn't belong in this system. It's, I mean, it is a, it is a period correct power supply, but I'm not putting a nice, fancy, colorful power supply like this, like th this, into a computer like this. <laughs> I've got an, I've got another system that is much more deserving of this power supply. But the power supply I'm going to be putting in here is another very high quality power supply that is also period correct. It came out of a Dell Optiplex. It came out of a Dell Optiplex system of some description. I think, uh, I don't think it was 170, I think a GX240 or 270. Yeah, Dell Optiplex GX270. I came to have three of these. And one of them was one of them was dead. The power, the the motherboard was bad, and I went ahead and stripped it for all of its good parts. I've got one in storage, I think, and then I've got one sitting here under the tech room workbench. So, yeah, we have a USB controller card and a modem, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill like three birds with one stone here, and. The modem is coming out because this system does not need a modem of any sort. We don't even have a landline. We have not had, we, we haven't had a copper telephone landline since 2017. So we're talking about six and a half years ago because it was in June or thereabouts of 2017, June or July of 2017, whenever we finally killed the landline. So, I mean, it, it's been a while, and yeah, I, I bought this. I bought this graphics card to go with this computer, and then I got busy with life and whatnot, and so it's been an ignore. It, it has been, uh, I think, a month or two since I've actually been able to uh, work on this thing because I mean. If it hasn't been one thing, it's been three others at the same time. And sometimes it's everything at the same time, much to my, uh, not so great, much to my, uh, chagrins, basically. But, as soon as I can get this thing out of its anti-static bag, which I guarantee you is not the factory packaging, it's, a uh, one of these reclosable anti-static bags. There we go. For a, moment, for a moment I thought I'd have to cut the bag, which I really didn't want to do because oh, what is going on here? Ah, look, it's the age-old problem of someone has screwed a cable in way, way, way too tight. 
I mean, I don't plan on using the DVI connection on this card anyways, but... Oh, look, it's even happened to the VGA port. So I guess whoever was using this card previously, which wasn't me... I guess whoever was using this card previously was running some sort of a dual monitor set up and just cranked the cable in way too tight. Well, what I'm going to do is kind of kill three birds with one stone here. I'm going to install the AGP card, I'm going to remove the modem, in fact I've, re I've already removed the modem, and I'm going, to go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and blank off the slot where the modem used to live. And this is all getting done in basically one fell swoop. Because all I got to do is pull the expansion, uh, pull the uh, blank expansion card uh, blank out of where the AGP card is going, stick it where the modem used to go, then I can go ahead and toss the modem onto a growing pile of modems. I mean, seriously, I have way too many of these modems to count. I think the last time I counted, I had like 12 or 18 of these PCI modems. If you want, if you want one of these little PCI wind modems, just, if you want one of these little PCI wind modems, just email me and I'll probably send you like five or six of them. In fact, I'll probably send you all my stocks, that way I can get rid of them, because I don't want these modems. <laughs> so, anyways, blanking, uh, blanking plate's been moved. And I'm just going to go ahead and take this card, click it down in here, and see what happens. Of course, I'm going to make the bold assumption that it's just going to go ahead and click in and not fight me every step of the way. Put that down in there. Realize that it's probably going to be a little bit too close to comfort in the memory module slots. So that'll be the next thing. We're, that'll be the thing we're actually about to take care of. We'll, so the first thing I'll do is go ahead and pull all the memory modules out. We've got the factory modules, Samsung Brandon, uh, 256 megabytes, DDR, PC2700, uh, two and a half clock cycle latency, and CL2.5, that's clock latency 2. That's a clock latency represented in number of clock cycles. 256 megabytes, PC2700, CL2.5, this is the A-Pacer module. So we've got three practically identical modules here. And then we've got this odd one out. Uh, 512 meg, DDR, 2700, doesn't tell me what the clock latency is. And it says lifetime memory products. Yeah, we'll just go ahead and switch it out for this actual name brand Micron module. 256, ugh, 256 megabytes, DDR. It says, three, it says 333, that's megahertz. You multiply by 8, you get real close to PC, 20, you get real close to 2700. Uh, fun fact, if you multiply your clock speed by 8, you'll get your, basically your PC rating. And if you divide your PC rating by 8, you'll get approximately your clock speed. And then CL 2.5, that's clock latency of two and a half cycles. So, the way I'll set, the way I'll set the memory up here is I'll go ahead and I'll put the factory modules in uh, slots two and four. You know what, I'll put them in slots one and three. And I'll put the upgrade modules in slots two and four. I'll put the micron, I'll put the micron module in slot two. And of course, the computer is probably going to notice this and tell us all about it. And I think I just realized that these uh, Samsung memory modules are just rebranded Micron modules, or the Micron modules are just rebranded Samsung modules. Because those three modules all look the same. Then I'll go ahead and take the A-Pacer module and place it all the way over in slot 4. And click it and click that into place. There we go. And now we'll go ahead and install our AGP graphics card, a Radeon 
9600 XT. So, place that in there, line it up with the AGP slot. Make sure we're lined up there, and click. Card is locked in and good to go, hopefully. Now, what I'll do now, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and switch out the hard drive, unplug our 80 conductor ribbon cable, hit the release lever, try to back this thing out without absolutely destroying my finger in the process. Okay, that wasn't too terrible. And then, then what I'll do is I'll come over here with the, I'll come over here. And I realized that I forgot to screw in the uh, Radeon Pro 9600. 96, All right. Then I'll go ahead and I'll just unscrew this drive. It's a WD800BB, and I think the BB, I think the BB in this case indicates that it's uh, a direct descendant of the, of the Pro T series drives. And I don't believe this drive was ever replaced. I don't believe this drive was ever replaced under warranty. Because this because I mean this appears this drive appears to be about as old as a computer. And I only see I only see witness marks from one hard drive being installed uh, here, so I have no reason to suspect this drive was ever replaced. I mean, and let me see, November seventh, two thousand three. Yeah, this this is the original drive out of this system. So now. We're going to take our special edition 80 gigabyte hard drive. And slot this in here. I think that looks good. start the screws. I'm not going to actually tighten the screws all the way down because I still need to get the other three screws lined up and put in. Some of these screws are being a little bit cantankerous for some reason. And this fourth screw I'll go ahead and just drive this all the way down. Hopefully without cross hopefully without doing anything creative like cross threading it. And then snapping the head off, leaving the threads permanently entrenched in the drive. Not the greatest thing in the world to do. And then now with our new hard drive screwed in. Just go ahead, push that back down, make sure to avoid pinching the floppy cable. And there we go. Plug it in. Actually, need to go ahead and move our uh, move our configuration jumper over here because right now I don't know if you're able to I don't know if you're able to see, but that is currently set to the this drive is configured as a slave device, and for those of you who don't know about how these IDE hard drives got configured. There's this jumper here that tells the IDE controller whether the drive is in cable select mode, uh, 
which is where the IDE controller determines what drive is where on the cable and configures accordingly. Slave mode, which is where uh, the drive tells the IDE controller that it's a slave device. Master, which is where the drive again tells the IDE controller that it's a master device. Then we have an empty set of jumpers there, well at least not, not empty, but certainly not labeled. And then PW2, I forget what that is. But what I'll do here is I'll just reach in here. Back this jumper out. Go ahead. Put this in the master position there. And I can go ahead and plug in the IDE cable. So, I mean, most people say most people say just put the drive in cable select mode. Most people say to just put the drive into cable select mode. I don't like doing that because I've had I've had IDE controllers do really weird things in cable select mode and I found I found that personally it's just much less trouble to go ahead and put the thing in, just go ahead and put hard hard jumper the drives for master and slave and that eliminates a pretty good host of problems. So now I'm putting in our power supply here. This is a very this is a very beefy, very heavy 250 watt Dell, 250 watt power supply. It says Dell. I highly doubt it's made by Dell. I'd probably say it's made by Hypro or Glidon. Uh, it says PS 5251 2 DFS. And it looks suspiciously like a Glidon power supply. Either that, uh, either that or Hypro. So. But either way, this is a very beefy, very heavy, very high quality power supply. And I even got the orientate the orientation correct in the first try. Isn't that nice? So I'll go ahead and go ahead and put the screws in here. It's just a matter of it's just a matter of plugging everything in. I mean, this power supply is from the Pentium 4 era, and it did it is rated 22 amps on its 5 volt rail, and 16 amps on its 12 volt rail, and 18 amps on its 3.3 volt rail. So this is definitely a power supply from from that era because. This era of com this era of computing, the uh, early 2000s and whatnot, well, we were beginning to shift away from most of our load being on the five and 3.3 volt rails. There was still a lot, a lot of load on the five and 3.3 volt rails, and so it was not uncommon to see power supplies rated at. 15, 20, 25, even 30 amps on the 5 volt on the 5 volt rail and you'd see a similar amperage rating on the 3.3 volt rail because because back in say like the, uh, the back in say the AMD Duron era those those processors were uh, were 5 volt processors and you also had systems that uh, the process that had a uh, basically a down converter architecture where the processor would be you know where the processor would run at 3.3 volts but the uh, the motherboard would not directly connect the processor to the 3.3 volt rail the motherboard would instead have the processor connected to the 5 volt rail 
not 5 volt rail. The motherboard would instead have a down have a DC to DC down converter on the 5 volt rail that generated the 3.3 volts for the uh, processor. It stepped it, it converted it down to 3.3 volts for the processor. And this of course means that you have less load on your power supply's 3.3 volt rail, which also means that you don't have to have is beefy of the 3.3 volt rail on the supply. But it did mean that you had to have a pretty beefy 5 volt rail on the supply. And then you also have to factor in that things were not as power, things were not as efficient with power as they are today. In, well, most cases, I mean, look at NVIDIA's RTX graphics cards, the power numbers are off the charts for those. And, so I mean, it, it, it was a different time then, not only for computing, but also for the electrical power demands of computing. So I mean, some, in some ways things were more efficient, and, uh, and in other ways things were less efficient. And speaking, oh, wait, there we, there we go. I was about to say, speaking of efficient, the placement of these optical drives power connectors are not very efficient, but turns out they are, I just didn't see it. So, I'm going to plug in the hard drive, make sure I don't accidentally break the thing, because it was making some not terribly great sounds. I took the slack up out of the way, I'm going to keep the USB I'm going to keep the USB card up in there. And one last minute change, one last minute thing that I almost forgot to do, was to go ahead and this little cable, this little cable in here. And basically what this does is you connect it to your optical, you connect it to your optical drive, and then you connect it to the motherboard. Uh, your motherboard so well, you're not having and what that'll do is it'll allow the optical drive to directly send audio into the system's sound card or sound subsystem without having to uh, push that data over a for the time extremely congested IDE bus but I think one of these optical drives is flaky regarding CDs and I don't know which one so I'm not going to put that cable in for now. We'll do that later. And I really don't feel like trying to get into the cavern, that is, the space where the optical drives live, because, well, that's rather uncomfortably cramped, and I'd rather not stick my fingers in there. Right now. So, I think for now, well, I don't think I'm going to put the side of the computer on at the moment. <coughs> What I am going to do is I am going to set this thing back up, plug it in, and then we'll have a smoke test, power it up, see if it survives. Okay, computer is plugged in. I've got the lighting and camera and everything adjusted. So now what I'm going to do is I turn this lamp on because it makes it a little bit more friendlier looking in here. Turn the power strip on. Computer. Computer doesn't do anything. Monitor comes on as we can see. And we're gonna fire it up. And have ourselves a smoke test. Three, two, one, fire and hole. Oh, here we go. Go and hit F2 to get into the BIOS. It looks like we may be having a bit of trouble on the hard drive front because our hard drive activity LED is stuck. Well, it was stuck on. And we seem to have hung. Keyboard controller is responding, so we're not completely 
up the creek. Yep. Beep, 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 beep. Hard drive was not found. Consult the troubleshooting section of your user's manual. Okay. So it looks like we do have some problems with our IDE configuration. Maybe it doesn't like the drive being hard jumpered. Press F4 to resume. I don't quite know what we're doing here. I hit F4 and nothing happens. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to power this thing down and I'm going to have a look at the IDE configuration and see what's going on. Whoa, what do you know? Got it done. <laughs> hey, look, dual channel. Awesome. Okay, I guess the uh, I guess the IDE controller didn't particularly like didn't particularly like the fact that I'd jumper the that I'd hard jumper the drive. Go ahead and just jump into the BIOS here, and now I'll go ahead and set up our camera. So, hyper-threading is enabled, 2.6 gigahertz, 800 megahertz front-side bus speed, 333 megahertz system memory speed, <clears throat> and I like what I see here. We are running in dual channel mode, four slots, 256 megabytes each, one gigabyte of RAM. And is it 22? Yeah, I'd say the date and time, yeah, date and time have held on quite well even though the system hasn't seen power in quite some time. Boot config, everything looks good there. Drive configuration. Type auto. 80 conductor cable. UDMA mode 5. Okay, well that looks good there. Two optical drives have been detected. <clears throat> Enhanced. Okay. Event log. View event log. Again, a bunch of keyboard not functional messages. And then, of course, the uh, this very bizarre machine check error. And, of course, I covered this and covered this in part one and the BIOS actually kind of did. BIOS went weird on me when it tried to display this one time. And I don't know what it's trying to. I don't know what it's saying. Trying to say here it says machine check error system will res. So I guess this is system will reset. I don't know. Video primary is AGP. Security, ACPI, boot device priority. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't see anything out of the ordinary or anything that would be cause for major concern. So now I'm going to go ahead and fish up a Windows XP install disk and go ahead and commence with a uh, Windows XP installation. Hey look, Windows XP Pro Service Pack 3. I don't know why, I have no idea why I burned this to a DVD Plus R, but I did. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the system off and put the side of the case on it. And put the side of the case on it before I actually start installing Windows. Because that hard drive has a pretty loud 
pretty pretty high frequency wind to it that I'd rather not hear because I know that the case is going to greatly attenuate that. And the optical drive gets loud too. So I don't know. I don't know what drive is going to work for us today, so I noticed that I had the Sony drive set as the uh, first bootable device. So. And there we go. Setup is inspecting the computer's hardware configuration. Uh, yeah, that's a floppy drive. I know that. I know that for sure. This should be a completely blank drive, and I think it. I think it is. I mean, I'm, yeah, it's a blank drive, I believe, because I mean the system didn't even attempt to boot from it. So we'll let this load and come back whenever it's done. Okay, looks like looks like we've already started the setup here. I don't know what we're I don't know what we're doing. I guess it's decided to just go ahead and take it upon itself to do the setup for me. So yeah, 80 gigabytes of blank hard drive. Go ahead and install here. Quick format with NTFS. Uh, I don't know if this is going to require that I reboot the computer. I think it might. Hear that hard drive clicking away. It, it it's a blank hard drive. Oh, I guess it's just gonna I guess it's just gonna go ahead and install now. Set up as copying files. Huh. I don't I I remember that I had I remember like 99% of the time I install Windows XP on a system, I have to uh, accept the license agreement and whatnot, but it's not doing that here. It could be because it found, could be because it found a Windows XP key sliced into the BIOS, and it's just going ahead and installing. Restarting computer. Yeah, it didn't even give me the uh, didn't even give me the countdown progress bar before it rebooted. No, we're not going to boot from CD. Obviously, we don't have functioning video drivers just yet. Monitor is a little bit out of adjustment. There we go. Set it will complete in approximately 40 minutes. <laughs> Here we go. Type your full name and the name of your company or organization. Hmm, okay.
Well, it hasn't yet prompted me for a uh, for a license key. Central time, automatically adjust clock. I'm gonna bump the minute. Installing network. <laughs> Yeah, looks like setup is almost complete. And we're probably about to reboot. Yep, there's a reboot. Oh, looks like we do have functioning video drivers now. And it looks like we have more, more setup to do. I don't know, it's been, it's been so long since I've installed Windows XP. I guess we don't have any sound drivers. prompt me for a license key. I guess we don't have any, I guess either it chose not to make sound or we just flat out don't have any working sound drivers on this system. So let's, yeah, I don't, I don't see a sound icon down here. Let's see, control panel, sound, speech, and audio devices, just a system volume, no audio device. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. So, let's see. Yeah, I just heard the PC speaker beep. Yeah, it doesn't have doesn't have any drivers for the Ethernet controller or the uh, multimedia audio controller. But it looks like looks like it managed to catch the drivers for everything else, showing two 2.6 gigahertz Pentium 4 processors, which is fine. We open up Task Manager here and switch to Performance. We see that there's two CPU usage history graphs. And then we have, let me see, it looks like we have a, we have a gigabyte of physical memory and commit charge. Yeah, it looks like looks like we have a gigabyte one gigabyte swap file too. Okay. Expand one file from installation source.
the, well, hmm, a gigabyte and a half, vir, gigabyte and a half virtual memory. Data execution prevention is turned on. Your computer's processor does not support hardware-based DEP. However, Windows can use DEP software to help prevent some types of attacks. Hmm, interesting. Um, we are not going to automatically restart upon system failure. Okay, okay, okay. Might as well restart. Yeah. This is when we can see just how long it takes to boot. Okay, give me back, give me back my, give me back my disk, please. Thank you. And why are we PXE booting? I think that's because I have a hard drive at the very, very, very last on the in the basically lowest priority in the boot order. So, oh, that's not it. Always going to be in here. Boot device priority. Let me set that to the hard drive. Set that to the Sony. Set that to the floppy drive and then turn that off. Save and exit. And that was actually that was a fairly fairly fast boot up time. So and then to finish off this video, because I think we've done plenty. I think we've done plenty for now. I think the I think the next thing we'll do here. I think the next thing we'll do next thing we'll do with this computer is uh, install. Install a few drivers and probably throw some games or something on here and see how it runs. So to finish this video off, we're just gonna go ahead and crash the we're just gonna go ahead and crash the computer. I know some versions of Windows will let you just crash the system by ending the CSRSS or Win Logon process or LSASS. Of course, I can I can end my own process right here. <laughs> just kill Task Manager and the icon disappears. So. I guess uh, I guess we can't actually crash the uh, system, at least not via that method. I think you have to get a system. I think you have to get a system level shell in order to have any hope of actually crashing the computer. But I don't want to do that right now because it's almost 11 o'clock. I'm tired. This video has been going on for a while, so I think that will do for now. This oh, wait, <laughs> almost forgot. I wanted to test the floppy drive to see if it works. So, got this got this driver diskette here uh, for a silicon image cell 3114. Uh, you know, for a silicon image cell 3114 card, a serial ATA controller card. So, I'm just going to pop. Whoop. Just going. Pop that into the floppy drive. My computer. 
go and have a look here. Yep, there it is. It works. I don't know what you're doing to that floppy disk at Windows, but don't. <laughs> Then, because we can, we'll go into the folder options menu and make this actually work. For some reason, I can't use a scroll wheel to scroll in there. Do display the contents of system folders. Do display the full path in the title bar. Do show hidden files and folders. Do not hide extensions from own file types. Now we just go, we just dive into here and do whatever. Wait, windows, oh, I can scroll there. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't know what's going on here. Of course, we could play pinball or something. Games. Pinball. Of course, we're not going to have any sound. Let's see. Player controls. Well, we could change. We could see if I could change the theme here. Appearance. We got Zune, Windows Classic, Windows XP. I like, Z I like Zune. Let's go and apply that. I have a, I've got a virtual machine on my main workstation running Windows XP Professional that has this Zune theme set. Ah, there we go. That looks purely correct. Ah, oh, there's a scent. Hiding the moon there. Or autumn. I like, I like autumn. That's actually one of my favorite Windows XP backgrounds. Got a gateway laptop with this... Got a gateway laptop and I'd always have this background set. And I just realized it actually plays into the Zoom, the Zoom theme really well. Might do some more customization in here. See what happens. Advanced. I, I, rem I remember playing with these. Uh, <laughs> I remember going into this advanced appearance dialog box and just absolutely playing around in here for like hours on end. So here's what we can do. We can make it a really, really dark gray and set the font color to white. Hit OK. Hit Apply. And now let's see what happens. That looks really good, actually. <laughs> but I'd play around in this menu. I'd go right-click, Properties, Appearance, Advanced, and I would just play around with all the options in here for hours on end. So... I think that's enough messing around with it for a while. At least at least until I record another video on it, which maybe tomorrow, maybe ten years from now, I don't know. Yeah, that actually looks really nice. So anyways, this is TCG Productions. Peace out guys, peace out, and I will see y'all in the next one.